Hello everyone, welcome to our section looking at the design of beams. So members undergoing flexion, it doesn't matter whether they're horizontal or vertical, it's members experiencing a bending moment. So we're going to be going through the various concepts um, associated with beams. And this section I know in this uh, steel design course is often where people struggle the most. There's quite a lot of concepts you need to catch on to and put all together to be able to get the moment of resistance of a section, understand how does it buckle, what is its resistance, etc. So try just focus on understanding the background concepts and what the equations are actually describing in each case. Now beams in practice can be used in many different ways. So for instance on the left hand side here uh, you've got a building going up and some columns and then beams spanning into it with primary and secondary beams um, running around and you'll actually see there's a whole bunch of holes that have been made into the beams those are for electrical services because um, this was going to a control room here you can see a floor as part of a an industrial building and this was actually for a, a manufacturing facility and uh, the, these columns and the roof also can be considered beams. They also carry bending moments um, from the system. And here then you can see a large um, storage facility storing bulk materials and very big plate girders and beams, etc. And uh, columns and lattices, etc, etc. So uh, for, through the whole section of beams times, uh, beam design, these are some concepts you'll need to understand. Firstly, types of beams, beam behavior, laterally supported and unsupported, moment rotation, classification, design by axial shear, wear buckling and crippling and, and calculation. So here is the sections of the code you should be able to understand and appreciate and refer to our other video where we go through these aspects, looking at what are the code uh, guidelines tell us and what are the calculations trying to predict. Here's some more examples of different sections, whether you've got channels, eye sections, crane beams. You put a channel on top of an eye beam to have high lateral stiffness. If you've got a crane sitting on top there, um, monosymmetric beam, um, plate girders, and then you can add stiffeners, composite beam, encased beam, etc. You don't often encase beams. That's a very unusual case. It's, it's far cheaper to use rebar, but there are specialist cases. Composite beams are quite efficient. The concrete slab acts compositely with it. So the compression is actually carried by the concrete and then the tension by the beam. So uh, serviceability, often size, the size of beams is actually determined by serviceability. And so you do need to check this. And we don't make a big fuss of it in the course because it's quite a simple check. But often it governs your beam size. And uh, they range from L over 180 for purlins to L over 800 for sensitive crane girders. And... Depending on your finishes, the limit will change. And then also, if you don't have enough stiffness, you'll find your structure bounces. And you'll find this on the, the well, there used to be a bridge between the structures and um, construction management wing in the civil engineering department. And that has a bit of a bounce on it. Now, when it comes to beams, one of the concepts to understand is laterally supported versus unsupported. And laterally supported simply means no buckling. It means it doesn't experience lateral torsional buckling. And this here is lateral torsional buckling when the beam has a load and it both twists and rotates sideways. You can prevent that by having continuous lateral support. If we have lots of little supports all the way down the beam, we will prevent this buckling from happening. And so, for instance, here is an example of that occurring. Here you have um, beams and they are underneath a, a floor, and then the floor provides continuous lateral support all the way down the end. So they prevent those, those beams from buckling sideways. Same with this case. Here you've got a beam, and then you have um, a concrete floor connected to it, and this provides continuous lateral restraint. There's sort of 100 mil or 150 mil gaps between those ribs of the concrete beam, but that's far shorter than the buckling length of the beam. So it's, it, you can treat it as continuously laterally supported. And so here you can see a, a beam, and this is un laterally unsupported. The, both this top beam and this bottom beam can experience buckling behavior. So just be careful, laterally unsupported, it um, can buckle, laterally supported, it can't or it won't. So when we have different sections, these are the 
um, stress distributions in the section. So this is the rotation and the moment. So you load it and load it and it keeps rotating and rotating. At the top you've got a plastic section. So you have a full plastic distribution through the section. So you have an MP resistance. MP equals ZP times FY. And uh, you'll actually see it goes a little bit beyond that as you get possibly approaching an ultimate stress. But uh, then you've got a compact section which is basically um, full yield over the, the surface. You, you can just about ignore it. Once again, you get a full plastic capacity. Then you've got a semi-compact se um, section. This one we assume is going to hit yield. So we load and load it and it just goes past yield. So we will take it up so that the stress is maximum stress. Now, at this point, and this is a um, elastic limit. If you load it and load it and load it and then it the very very outer fiber hits yield if you load it any further you'll have plastic deformation it won't go back to where it started but if you load it to this configuration um, equals Z times FY or you will then have a situation where it's just hitting at plasticity. It'll either go back to where it started, or if you keep loading it, it'll then have permanent plastic deformation. And then a class four section is a slender one where it doesn't reach yield at its outer fibers because local buckling occurs. And so this explains the same thing as you progress from um, stresses from elastic to elastic limit, these are elastic limit, through elastoplastic all the way through to plastic. So these are the sort of strains and the stresses you would get as you progressively increase the rotation up until you have a full plastic distribution over the section. And so if we um, idealize this behavior, we, we assume it's just a linear elastic perfectly plastic moment. In reality it's not exactly that. The relationship for an I-beam is actually closer to this and then if you include residual stresses it looks like that. So you don't have an exact um, behavior but it's, it's close enough that we can assume bilinear and then design around that. And in terms of classification see other videos but just remember classification is for local buckling and so you want to see with the flange experience buckling with the web experience local buckling and this would occur over a short distance as it as it buckles and so just be careful of all the definitions of what is b over t now we've been talking about a plastic modulus and you will have covered this earlier in your degree but i generally find most people have forgotten this by this stage so um SANS 10162 Parsnet is a plastic design code allowing, allowing members to obtain a fully plastic section. The plastic module, ZPL, is a first moment of area, sum of all areas times distance, i.e. So you can work out your ZPL simply by multiplying areas times the distance to its centroid. And where Y is the distance from the plastic neutral axis. So where ZE, your elastic section, is your I over Y um, of your top and bottom. And you can have it two different ZEs. For, you can have a ZE top and a ZE bottom, and the lower one will govern your resistance. ZPL, um, there's only one value. And I'm just going to quickly show you the derivation of how do you find the plastic neutral axis. Here you have a cross-section of a asymmetric um, I-beam. And so the top flange is bigger than the bottom. Now, if we loaded it to the point where it got a fully plastic section, so let's say it's a class one section, you end up with a distribution like that of stress. And so you will have all of the stresses um, being at yield. And if you then want to calculate the forces, what you will find is that then, for instance, there is a compression force at the top. Um, so there's a, a compression force at the top. Let's call it C1, and then let's say there's a force in that C2, and uh, then a tension force here, T1, and or let's call it T2 to be on the inner one, and then T1. So um, that gives you a, a, a distribution of uh, force in it. And we will now need to make sure that firstly there's equilibrium. 
because if there is not, you've got a problem. So then you, you have the section accelerating or something. Well, then you, you also have an, ax, an axial load, then it'll cause it to be unbalanced. But so now we've got two, two forces in each. These have to be the same. So C1 plus C2 equals T1 plus T2. And this is based upon summer forces horizontally equals zero. And uh, if you have a look at these different um, areas, I'm just going to call this A, C1 would be the top area, etc. So I'm going to just give them sort of little zones, A, C2, etc., A, T2, and A, T1. So all of these you will find Fy times So this should be fairly obvious that uh, all this is exactly the way the, the um, equation will work out. And then what you find is all the yield stresses carry. And so AC1 plus AC2 equals AT1 plus AT2, uh, which you could say is area below plastic neutral axis equals area above plastic neutral axis. And so that is how you can derive where is the plastic neutral axis. Assuming that the, the yield strength of the material is the same, uh, you can then just find it that way. And then it's actually quite a simple process to find where is this plastic neutral axis, what is its distance from the top or the bottom. So then once you have that, you, you will find that your moment of resistance equals the sum of the forces times the distance to the neutral axis. And uh, if you sum those up, so you will have then a, a force times a distance, you add up all the sum of forces times distance, and what you'll end up then, if I uh, substitute all of those in, for instance, um, L of um, T1 times by A T1 times Fy plus dot dot dot, you'll find that the L1 times um, A, well, multiply together, so the distance to the plastic neutral axis times the area equals um, the ZPL, but ZP or ZPL equals sum of L times A. You will have it's a first moment of area, therefore your moment of resistance is ZPL times Fy. That gives you your moment of resistance. So that's how you'd go about from first principles getting the um, firstly the, the ZP or ZPL value and um, you know, calculating the moment of resistance.